I was born actually in uh, Flushing Hospital, Flushing, and uh, the when they uh, made the Long Island Expressway, it went over our house, so we had to move out. <laughs> and at that, that time too, my father had died when I was seven years old, and. Uh, so we moved out to Hicksville with uh, an uncle of mine, and basically most of the time grew up in Hicksville, Long Island. George Lang was drafted into the Army in March of 1968, just before his 21st birthday. After basic and then advanced infantry training, Lang arrived in Vietnam in the fall of the same year. In February of 1969, Lang was scheduled to go on leave at the same time that intelligence reports were indicating a concentration of enemy troops nearby within Kien Hoa province. So I got a new pair of boots, I had them spit shined, ready to leave, and uh, it was the uh, first sergeant of the company came up to me, he says, we've got a mission on uh, the 22nd, he says, you have to go along, he says, because I'm short on MCOs. And, uh, you know, so you have to go. I says, all right, I'm gonna go to the, into the field with spit shine boots. <laughs> Cause I only had like one pair and, uh, you know, I didn't trade it in for the, for the new ones. So I was going out into the field with spit shine boots. <laughs> well, we uh, had taken the tangos, you know, off the ship at that time we were on the ships and uh, going down a canal to an area that had been blown up by artillery. We got there, we landed, got off the boats, uh, went in maybe about 50 meters and we saw uh, all these bunkers uh, with communication wire going from bunker to bunker. In my squad, I was a squad leader at that time, I, uh, I was walking point because I had guys that were there in my squad one month, maybe a month and a half, and I had guys that were there 11 months, 10 months, were getting a little bit nervous, you know, that they uh, uh, were just about ready to leave like in another month. So I elected to walk point even though I was a squad leader, and I spotted a, a hooch or a house, and in front of the house there were five VC armed with weapons. And I got the guy who had the M79 grenade launcher, and we jumped into this hole that was uh, blown up by the artillery. So it was like, you know, a hole that we could uh, get in, have a little bit of a cover. And when we did that, uh, we opened up. He got off about two rounds. I got off about one magazine and the red ants had attacked us. The, the you know artillery had opened up a nest of red ants and there was a canal nearby it was filled with, not filled, but you know, maybe two feet of water. So we just jumped in there, got the shirts off, you know, trying to get all these ants all, all over us. And uh, that day they had the, we had the dogs with us that day. So they went up to where the hooch was and uh, found some blood trails. And they followed the blood trails, found uh, two, you know, dead VC. And then we uh, continued on. And if, as we got in maybe another 50 yards, they opened up on uh, the column on the left, the first platoon. and wounded or you know wounded or killed maybe the first five guys and i saw where the fire was coming from under heavy enemy fire lang sprinted toward the bunker and eliminated it with his rifle and hand grenades and when i got back to the squad i couldn't find the radio man they didn't know where he was so i figured well maybe he went up with me and uh you know he might be somewhere up front so i uh, we started getting fire from a second bunker. When another bunker opened up with machine gun fire directly in front of him, Lang jumped over a shallow canal and destroyed it as well. And after I blew the second bunker, we found a cache of uh, enemy weapons, uh, ammunition, landmines, entrenching tools, 
So I brought the squad up to secure the cash that we found. And uh, then they opened fire from a third bunker and uh, I saw where the smoke was coming to and I got you know, pretty close, did a little bowling. I you know, popped a grenade and uh, let the hammer go. Waited like you know four seconds because it you know it takes like seven seconds for it to blow up, so you didn't want it thrown back at you. So then I just rolled it along the round and actually got it down the hole before it blew. After Lang destroyed the third enemy bunker, he returned to the area of the weapons cache, and his squad again came under heavy rocket and automatic weapons fire from three sides. The squad suffered numerous casualties and Lang was one of those seriously wounded. B-40 rocket blew up somewhere around me and hit me with a piece of shrapnel in the spine. And then finally the medic came up to me and he, you know, he says, where are you hit? So I said, I don't know, I just can't move. And uh, I had like a concussion had blown open my wrist a little bit and he started bandaging my wrist and he got shot in the hands and then he went running back. So then I was, uh, you know, on the ground and uh, feeling a little cold. So I put my arm over my chest like this and I got hit with a bullet in the elbow here, which went up here and just missed my head. <laughs> uh, and then, you know, which seems, it seemed like it only lasted like maybe an hour, maybe an hour and a half, but actually it went from the morning to like late afternoon to like, uh, you know, around three or four in the afternoon. And finally, they got up to me and they got me back. Although immobilized and in great pain, Lang continued to direct his men. He insisted on evacuating others first until his evacuation was ordered over his protests. February of 71, when uh, the last address they had was my mother's address in Hicksville, she had her, her own apartment then. FBI guy came to the door looking for me. And uh, so, you know, she, I was, at that time, I had gotten out of the hospital and was living with friends of mine because I couldn't live with my mom. She was up a flight of stairs at that time, this apartment that she had. It's like a regular two-family house, you know, with this apartment upstairs. So I went to live with a friend who had everything on the ground floor and I, you know, just, staying with, in a, with a room in a, in a room with him uh, and his family, you know, that lived there. And she called me and then they got in touch and then they told me that, you know, I was to receive the Medal of Honor in Washington in March, I think it was March 2nd that I went to Washington. Yeah, it's like totally shocked. I mean, you know, I, I, I was wondering, I figured, you know, maybe I'd get uh, another bronze star or a silver star or something like that. And we get there and they said, you know, you have to introduce your family to the president. You know, you're not nervous enough, right, with receiving the medal. Now you have to do a little talking, too. <laughs> I was so nervous. <laughs> I, you know, I couldn't remember it too much. You know, I just remember putting the medal and shaking my hand. And then, you know, I had to introduce my family, so I probably cut them off right away and said, oh, this is my mom, you know. The uh, Seaford Manor School in Seaford, that usually on uh, Memorial Day or uh, Veterans Day, they'll invite me down. And uh, so I usually, you know, teach them that they're here today enjoying the freedom that they do uh, because of people that have given their lives for them so they can maintain their, uh, their freedoms that they enjoy today. It's not just the Medal of Honor recipients, but you know, all the veterans in the war and the ones that gave their supreme sacrifice. You know, that uh, people should, you know, look up to veterans and uh, thank them. <laughs>